Hey everybody, it's Jason Blaha here, and today I want to talk to you guys about something that's been a topic lately, stuff I've been seeing come through my feed a lot on social media, and that's this idea that things like processed sugars aren't necessarily the problem, they're not one of the biggest factors in obesity, that the solution to the obesity epidemic is for people to just track their macros. So uh, let me put on my plus five hat of weaponsmithing. Work on skilling up my crafting a little bit and let's talk about this. And let's talk about why this isn't necessarily the most viable solution and why it probably isn't going to help the majority of people who are struggling with obesity out there. Um, and the thing that was interesting, what I've seen presented, is the idea that sugar isn't necessarily uh, responsible. And I will agree, sugar is not the only thing responsible. It's a factor, but it's certainly not the only factor. And it's being presented because uh, obesity rates were going up at the same rate of co sugar consumption at one time, and then the public was warned about sugar, and then sugar intakes dropped back. It didn't keep climbing, but obesity rates kept climbing. So therefore, it's not necessarily the sugar. Um, but we're going to go somewhere with that because it isn't about one specific ingredient. It's a larger dynamic at play that is uh, fueling the obesity epidemic in the United States and it's spreading through the rest of the Western world. There is more than one factor at play and it's not just one food ingredient. But the idea that counting macros is going to work, uh, let's talk about that for a minute. Anyone who thinks that that's going to work for people who have major eating problems and major appetite issues, that just counting their macros is going to resolve that, has probably never been very obese themselves. They probably have never dealt with this because in my personal experience, um, just tracking macros doesn't work very well for most people who have struggled with body weight very seriously at different points of their life. Again, such as people such as myself. Um, I'm a chronic overeater and I'm very aware of that. I'm very aware of the causes and triggers, both the physical and psychological in myself. Um, again, being aware of these things helps. But here's the thing, tracking macros, first of all, uh, I honestly believe like meticulous tracking of macros itself leads to eating disorders. Now, that doesn't mean it can't be a viable weight loss strategy. In fact, in fact, let's be frank, how many people who are in various physique competitions, whether it's men's physique or uh, bodybuilding or women bikini contest, plenty of them track their macros religiously and they become some of the leanest people on earth. I mean, at contest time, many of these people are, are at body fat levels that are dangerously low that a medical doctor would look at their blood work and freak out over. Like they have pushed stuff so extreme that they are uh, borderline anorexic or they are basically anorexics just with more muscle mass than an anorexic. They have starved themselves. Um, and that is proof that it can be work for some people for losing fat. I mean, when you can get your fat so low that it's dangerous to your health, all right, that's, that's definitely fat loss. So and no one's going to argue that point. But what are physique competitors also known for? Eating disorders, body image disorders. As a demographic, as a demographic, there is no demographic on earth with a higher percentage of eating disorders and uh, body image disorders than men and women's both physique competitors. These people are a mess in terms of this stuff. And this macro counting doesn't help. All right, these are people who are oftentimes predisposed to this and then the methods they use to get there uh, cause additional eating disorders. Uh, definitely can be a problem. Everything from anorexia, bulimia, um, obsession with their food, absolute obsession with their food, uh, all the way up to things like, um, what's the newer one called, orthorexia nervosa. Uh, newer eating disorder identified a few years back. So there's definitely a problem with that. And here's the thing. The problem with obesity in the United States comes down to not just people being more sedentary. That's absolutely a factor. It's a big factor. Uh, less energy turnover, but it's hyper palatable foods. All right. Rather than stepping back and saying, oh, it's the vegetable oil. It's the flavor enhancers. It's the table sugar, it's the high fructose corn syrup, it's this, it's that. No, it's hyper palatable foods in general. We make foods that are very calorically dense, not very uh, appetite suppressing, meaning they're not very filling for the amount of calories they have, and we oftentimes add so much additional flavor to them uh, eat in all sorts of ways. Everything from sweeteners to adding fat and sugar together and all these things that make foods delicious so we want to eat more of them, it makes them hyper palatable. Foods that taste so good that you can't eat just one. 
our society is played with this. It's not because people aren't counting macros. Look how many societies out there actually eat decently society foods who do have plenty of foods who don't have an obesity problem. I mean, truth be told, there are plenty of nations in Asia, perfect example, that have almost no obesity that actually have an abundance of calories. Uh, these are people eating white rice all the time. But the thing is, it's not particularly easy to become obese on white rice, fish, and seaweed and vegetables. All right, it's difficult to do. I mean, even white rice, when you start adding in a bit of proteins, lean protein, and some vegetables, most people who are up and active, because these people have to be, are going to struggle to eat enough of it to become obese. It would be very difficult. Uh, even white rice, foods that a lot of people will try to blame for obesity. Refined grains, not really. They're still fairly satiating on a calorie-for-calorie -calorie basis. Uh, foods that tend to be a problem are things where we start adding a lot of liquid fats to it really really high fat foods particularly salty fatty foods uh, how about cheese how about bacon i mean these are the weaknesses of people even on ketogenic diets which is an appetite suppressing diet you combine all that salt and fat together it becomes hyper palatable and it's calorically dense so someone who's on even a keto diet who might do really well on steak and broccoli they switch over to bacon and cheese they start gaining weight happens all the time. You see even when people talk about on those forms. Um, how about when you start adding a lot of table sugar to things? Table sugar isn't very filling. High fructose corn syrup isn't very filling. It has a, It's fairly calorically dense, minimal real nutritional value outside of its calories, um, and it affects insulin sensitivity in the long term. All these foods that affect insulin sensitivity that are hyper palatable, you're going to tend to overeat them because they taste really good they really, really taste good. They're either really sweet or really fatty and salty combined together, or we, we take a bunch of sweet stuff and we add fat to it. Because again, what do humans crave? Salty, sweet, fatty. Uh, people think of things like different uh, pastries and stuff as sugary foods. No, you're combining a refined sugar with a bunch of fat, making it really calorically dense and taste really, really good. Hyper palatable, calorically dense foods. All right, that is the driving cause of the obesity epidemic. I mean, the liquid calories from sugars and high fructose corn syrup, sure, that's a factor. It's very easy to get those calories in. They can negatively affect insulin sensitivity in the long term, which again, can make your appetite bounce around easier. There's the dopamine issue with the refined sugar in some people's brains, right? That's a factor. Adding all this extra fat and oils to things that make them taste better, uh, a big factor. You're adding caloric density, making it taste better, right? There is your problem. It's not the sugar. It's not the oil. It's not any one given thing. It's the fact that we have foods that are hyper palatable, that we've done different things to to make them taste really good, to really hit those sweet taste buds or those fatty, salty taste buds in our tongue that are very calorically dense, a lot of calories per unit of food. All right, that's your problem. That's what fuels obesity. We tend to overeat when we do that. And here's the thing. If people sit around continuing to eat these foods every day all the time, here's your problem. Okay, so they want to count their macros. You give them macros to follow. You give them caloric numbers to hit. And they're still eating these hyper palatable, calorically dense foods. So they, you give them, oh, you're going to need to eat 2,200 calories. What happens when they eat 2,200 calories and it's 2 o'clock in the afternoon and their stomach starts grumbling again? because they were all hyper palatable, calorically dense foods. Then what? You really think the average person is gonna go hungry every day for the last eight hours of the day before they go to bed? Tracking their macros isn't gonna fix the problem. All right, tracking their macros isn't gonna fix the problem. The people who work in all these Pop-Tarts and ice cream and other crap into the if it fits your macros type diets, these are usually people who are on the other end. These are people who oftentimes struggle to gain weight they struggle to bulk up and get big and muscular from lifting. Uh, and then now they're doing lots of weightlifting and lots of cardio. Those are oftentimes people who really wouldn't have a problem being fat at all uh, if they just ate to their normal appetite and didn't track anything. But in order to hit their exact body composition goals, they need to track these macros. All right, so that they can make sure that they get enough food so they don't lose weight too quickly or so that they can ensure they're losing weight, not just maintaining but the people who do that and work these treat foods in every day are usually people who've never struggled with appetite or obesity or food addiction or anything. Well, 
the people like that aren't the people that are contributing to the obesity epidemic. That's your problem. This isn't going to work for the average person. The average person needs to cut out or minimize these hyperpalatable foods. They're just going to have to live with blander foods, or if they eat foods that taste good, they're going to need them to be very filling uh, foods, you know, such as a really lean piece of steak. All right, that tastes really amazing to a lot of people. Um, but it's fairly filling. It's really high protein, not necessarily a lot of fat, other stuff in it. Or they're going to need to find variations of these different good tasting foods that fill them up. Learning to fill up on veggies uh, before they eat the other stuff. Limiting their sweets. Limiting, adding extra oils or sugar to anything. Avoiding liquid calories. Definitely avoiding junk foods or foods that are extremely hyper palatable like chips of different types. And when I say chips, I don't mean British chips. We call those french fries what the Brits call crisp. What Americans who are my bigger audience call chips. All right, chips, things like that. French fries. I mean, <laughs> these foods are foods that people are going to tend to way overeat on. They're very easy to overeat on. And if you want to cure the obesity epidemic, you've got to get people away from these foods. It isn't necessary for the average obese person to necessarily track anything to lose weight. It can be a useful tool, but it's not necessarily going to deal with the underlying issue. The massive appetite and overeating issue isn't going to go away just because they try to track it. That isn't going to fix the problem in isolation, uh, and it isn't a necessary tool to even fix the problem. For most of these people, getting away from the hyper palatable and extremely calorically dense foods, that's going to be their solution. Having these people focus primarily on whole foods, focusing on whole foods that are filling, have a lot of fiber or a lot of protein in them, uh, with minimal amounts of uh, sugars of any type, refined or otherwise, not a lot of fat, things like that. That's how you're going to fix most of these people's problem. And you've got to get them up and get them active. But tracking their macros is not going to fix the root of the problem because you don't always have these problems in every other country. Even in countries that have plenty of food and calories, you still don't see obesity problems until you start throwing huge amounts of hyper palatable foods at them. And it doesn't matter where the source of that hyper palatability and caloric density comes from. It just matters that it's there. Foods that it's easy to overeat. All right, guys, but that's really all I have to say on that today. I hope it's been informative, and I will talk to you guys next time.